Uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, this seems to be working. Uh, thanks for having me. So, uh, I'm going to give an uh, executive summary for the connoisseurs, should any be in this audience, um, which is the following. So, we considered uh, an example of a duality in string theory, namely t-duality. Usually, when you have t-duality, it's about uh, the equivalence of stringy physics on a space-time with uh, a circle symmetry or a torus symmetry. Um, but we considered instead a generalization where you replace the circles in tori with non-abelian groups, and we consider further what happens in a situation where the action is not transitive, and for example, in a simple case, you have a principal bundle with circle or torus fibers, you replace the, uh, the fibers with non-abelian groups, and then you try to consider uh, whether you can have a change in topology, a change in the global vibration structure. Uh, in that case, for example, a trivial bundle to a non-trivial bundle. So that's the that's a lightning summary. Um, so yes, so I'll proceed by not uh, by uh, defining what string theory means uh, in this context because uh, I realize this is not a uh, this is not a string conference. So. Uh, let's go to, uh, back to basics. So, uh, string theory is about this variational problem. So, it depends on um, an embedding of some string world sheet, a two-dimensional manifold, into your target space. That's uh, usually a pseudo-Riemannian manifold, which means um, the the metric has signature minus one plus plus plus. If somebody tells you they work with plus minus minus minus, then they're a fraud. Never work with them. Um, uh, but if the minus bothers you, you can pretend it's Riemannian, because I, I'm going to ignore the metric shortly. Uh, yes, so the, the functional is the induced uh, area of the world sheet. That's one term. And the second term is the um, integral of a uh, what's locally a two-form uh, pulled back to the world sheet. So um, the string directly sees two pieces of geometric data, one which is the metric uh, of the target manifold, which I'm mostly going to ignore, and the other, which this talk will focus largely on, is this, uh, this h-flux. It is a closed three-form, and under certain conditions you can interpret this term, which looks very three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional, has a two-dimensional um, an honestly two-dimensional term. And this is, in fact, the case when the, uh, this closed three form has integral fluxes. So if it represents an integral cohomology class. Okay, and B is uh, what's often called a B field or um, Kalbramon field. It's the locally defined potential for, for H. And there's an ambiguity if you write it this way, and then it, it goes away when the uh, fluxes are integral. Um, which I'm not going to explain how that works. So uh, if that's confusing, just think uh, we have a manifold with a metric and a closed three form. Okay, so uh, what's the duality of string theories in this, in this setup? Well, you can consider two uh, kinds of variational problems. One with the data you have a manifold M, a metric G, and an H flux H. In general, there's also going to be extra data which do not appear directly here, and I'm ignoring them. And uh, you can consider, okay, I may go on, and you can consider a, <laughs> a different uh, manifold M prime, you can consider met with a metric G prime and another three form H prime. And uh, so we say that we have a duality when uh, the, the, uh, these variational problems are equivalent in a sense that I will uh, make precise in, in the sequel. And uh, moreover, we're going to focus on um, the cases where uh, M prime is not isometric to M, or is not even diffeomorphic to M. Uh, why are we doing that? Well, um, well, we, we have to do that if we want to isolate any stringy physics. Uh, and uh, you can even see this very directly if you stare at these uh, variational principles for a while. Um, you can write down a one-dimensional analog of this. Um, 
and you can study the geometry of your manifold using the one-dimensional version of this functional, but then this is just studying the geometry of some manifold using uh, through the uh, uh, geodesics on that space, which is very classical. I mean, it's not going to be very interesting. So the novelty, and obviously this will uh, only yield uh, dualities that go from between isometric manifolds. Um, so the interesting uh, and essentially stringy stuff happens when uh, M and M prime are, have different geometries and even different topologies. Okay. Right. So, um, so the very I think the original example of uh, dualities of this form and the the one that's going to motivate most of this talk is T duality. Uh, here's the most basic example. So you have a manifold M that's a product. You have B is a B will mean base, and it won't do anything. It's just spectating. I'm also going to call this spectators, and it's a product of uh, the spectators cross a circle of some radius r, and um, you can do a calculation that I'm not going to display, and you can find that you get equivalent physics on uh, the same uh, manifold but with a different with a different geometry. In fact, the radius. Uh, r, so the, the, the length of the circle goes to the inverse length, and there is a oh. ah, this is better. And there is a constant um, alpha prime, which is uh, universal, and you don't need to know what this is. Nobody knows what it is. Um, so uh, we have a change in uh, geometry in this situation because the, the length of the circle goes to inverse itself. Um, so how do you see T-duality? Well, um, the, well, the most expedient way is to consider um, string propagation on a bigger space time, on a, on a geometry where uh, you take the original circle, you take the D-dual circle, and you bring them together. Uh, is this too loud? It's fine. Okay, very good. And so you take a, a string on a bigger space time, and then you, uh, well, I say here gauging a current. If you don't know what this means, you can uh, view it as a symplectic reduction with respect to a circle action. So you take a bigger model, and uh, you do symplectic reduction with respect to one circle action. Obviously, this is the one corresponding to the dual circle, and then you get the original. Um, variational model, principle, uh, problem, sorry. And you do the same, but then you gauge, uh, you uh, do a symplectic reduction with respect to the original circle action, and then out comes the dual one. Um, and this is, in, uh, this is in general how dualities work in this context. You, um, you don't necessarily have a map from one thing to another thing directly, but you have a bigger object, and then you have a correspondence diagram and uh, which uh, reduces in some sense to your original object and to the dual object. And I have some physics, further physics motivation here, which I'm not going to explain. Okay, so uh, I can be a little more explicit, actually. Um, for this, it's convenient uh, to use the Hamiltonian formulation of this. So if you haven't seen something like this before, uh, it's when you take uh, a second order differential equation and you convert it to first order by replacing the velocities with momenta. Uh, so the claim is that this expression, where I set the, the h flux or the b field to zero because otherwise it takes up too much space, is equivalent to the uh, one I wrote before. So I chose some coordinates, I split the world sheet into time and space, which is totally arbitrary, and you can show that this is independent of this choice. And um, the point of doing it this way is that uh, you, can, uh, you can write down a nice object which uh, transforms linearly under t-duality. So it is given by the momenta along with the derivatives, the spatial derivatives of the positions. Um, so uh, if you have a d-dimensional torus, then um, the relevant group is uh, OD, D, which is the orthogonal group for a 
uh, bilinear form in 2D dimensions with split signature. And yeah, so this transforms linearly. And if you have, if you have say, uh, just one coordinate, one pair of position and momentum, then uh, you have what is uh, locally a symplectomorphism or canonical transformation between the original model and the dual one. And it looks like this. So here I use T tilde for T duality. Hopefully that's very obvious. And I say locally because you can't really invert these. Uh, you can mostly invert these, but you have an issue if with a finite dimensional space of zero modes. What you honestly have is a Lagrangian correspondence uh, between the original um, phase space, which is the, basically the cotangent bundle of the loop space of the manifold you're looking at, and the dual one. Okay? And a correspond Lagrangian correspondence is obviously a situation like this. You have a bigger, um, you have a Lagrangian submanifold in the product of the two things, and uh, you get uh, reductions. Okay? So, and um, yeah, so moreover, this is, uh, this picture is good enough, at least for physical purposes, so when the strings are cylindrical, so when you don't, when you don't have uh, interactions where splits join and break apart and so on. Um, if you want to have interactions, then you have to be really, really careful. Okay, so, um, okay, I'm doing okay time-wise. So, uh, yes, so we already saw that we can, um, when you have t-duality, you have a change in lengths, but what is more interesting, or at least what was, what is more interesting to physicists, is that you can also have a change in topology, and here is the original classic example, oh, this is still blue, isn't it? That's unfortunate. Um, which is very simple to describe. So. Hello. So one side of the duality is a three sphere, and we consider this as a principal circle bundle. Um, so the, famously, this is the Hopf vibration, and we consider a duality along the circle fibers. Okay, and uh, we set this uh, h flux three form to zero, and then these people found through a very detailed patchwise calculation, which you can view as a very careful. Uh, patching together relations of this form. Uh, these people found that this is dual to a configuration where it's not a non-trivial circle bundle, it's a sphere, it's a two-sphere cross a circle. Oh, also I faint, failed to mention there's the Hopf vibration, the base is a sphere, so it's a non-trivial bundle where the base and the total space and the fibers are all spheres. There's just a few of these. So uh, somehow the uh, non-trivial topology here is transmuted into um, H-flux, uh, which you can view if you want as, uh, so the topology goes into a cloud of, uh, cloud of strings. So this H-flux actually measures, um, is a density of, um, I don't know, strings. Um, you could call it that way. Um, anyway, so that's uh, that's not very important. So that was just uh, 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 that was uh, a little hand waving. Uh, yes. So uh, how does this work? So this uh, this dual H flux is non-zero and it's constructed out of the churn class of the S three, which we know is non-trivial, and out of the uh, volume of the S one here. And uh, this makes sense because this is a trivial bundle. You can just do this. Okay. So originally they did this with a formidable patchwise calculation, but it's 2022 and it's a mass conference, so uh, we really shouldn't be doing that. So what, uh, what these people did instead, they considered a, how to phrase this in a, in a more general uh, setting. Um, and they call this topological t-duality, and they call this um, topological because you really forget the metric is really doesn't really play much of a role uh, in this, except for the um, uh, except maybe for the for the uh, components that talk to the fiber, the KK photon, as I've called it. So most of the metric has went away here. So how does this work? 
So you start with a, so this is the simplest case. You start with a principal circle bundle, and you want these to be principal because if they're not principal, then uh, things get very ugly very quickly. In general, the T-dual can be a non-commutative space. If it, everything is principal, then it's all good. You start with a circle bundle, and so this is characterized by some H-flux and a, its uh, churn class, which is represented by two-form. And then you swap the original churn class with this two-form, which is the fiber integral of the original H-flux. And assuming that the, um, the three-form has integral fluxes, this will also be integral and will therefore define another circle bundle. And then you have a, a nice correspondence diagram. You can take the fiber product of these two things and then you have a big thing that redu reduces to two smaller things. And an important point is that the, the original and the dual H fluxes, well, they're cohomologous if you go to the big space. So you pull back the two things and you can write the difference in terms of the, uh, the connections on the circle bundles here. Okay, so uh, the point of this talk is to generalize um, this situation to the, uh, to the case where instead of circles and tori, you have non-abelian groups. So um, how exactly does this work? Okay, so let's consider firstly the case where you don't have any spectators. So this is just, um, uh, so no global uh, funniness going on. So uh, the easiest way to understand this is to consider this, this doubled picture, so this bigger space uh, from the beginning. And there's, um, so you replace the, so here you have uh, the fibers are, uh, so if this is a circle fiber, this is another circle fiber, this is a T2, a two torus. Uh, so you replace this in the non-abelian case with a group that has the structure of a Dernfeld double, and by that I mean such that it's Lie algebra, it's going to be 2D dimensional, and it's a sum as a vector space of two subalgebras, a little g and little g tilde in my notation. And uh, these are isotropic in some uh, inner product that's non-degenerate, and which is also invariant in the Lie algebra. Uh, and non-degeneracy actually implies it's 2D dimensional. Okay, and uh, just for illustration purposes, I schematically wrote down what the uh, structure constants of, of this look like. So, because this, uh, this inner product eta is non-degenerate, um, G and G tilde will in general not commute if at least one uh, subalgebra is uh, non-abelian. So you get a commutator that's like this. So it's not a direct sum of Lie algebras. Okay. And um, so if you have a situation like this, uh, typically you can integrate it to a nice non-abelian factorization of the group itself. So big G is uh, what's going to be, um, in the case where you don't have any spectators, it's going to be the uh, original space time, and then big G tilde is going to be the T-dual one. And every uh, group element in the double has this unique factorization. Uh, it's going to be non-abelian when at least one of the factors is non-abelian because of this uh, uh, bracket relation here. So obviously, if you have a two-dimensional torus, then this is an example of a Dernfeld double. So this is how the original abelian t-duality is contained in this case. Okay, so that's straightforward. Right, so uh, the claim is that if you have, uh, I should re replace this sigma, sigma models is the name we use for this kind of variational problem, uh, whose target manifolds uh, are G or G tilde such that they fit into this Drinfeld double object, well, they can be T-dual. Um, and we say these are Poisson Lee T dual because uh, when you have this situation, each uh, Lagrangian subgroup inherits a Poisson bivector. And just to sketch how this comes about, it basically comes from the adjoint action of one group 
on the dual Lie algebra. And this works because both of these are contained in this, uh, in this uh, Lie algebra of the Dernfeld double. Okay. Um, yes, a Poisson by vector, it's anti symmetric. 10 minutes, okay. That works fine for me. And um, you can then write down, a, well, I chose a very explicit expression, but perhaps um, I now realize this might be a bit opaque. Uh, you can write down a formula like this, and then you can massage this so that it looks like the original object here, which takes a lot of work, but it's perfectly doable. And this specifies the, um, the metric data and the h-flux data at the same time. So notably, you get this explicit appearance of the bivector over here, and then, uh, so this is just some constant d by d invertible matrix. So the interesting fact is that if you have two such things and you go the Hamiltonian formulation again, they're related by a canonical transformation. And this was uh, found in the 90s. Um, and it looks almost exactly like the formula I gave before for the abelian duality case, uh, uh, with the difference that uh, the Poisson bivectors appear explicitly. And here I replaced what was... Uh, the derivatives of the coordinates with, um, uh, well, basically logarithmic derivatives of the groups, uh, of the group uh, valued coordinates. And obviously, if you have an abelian double, then the bi vectors go to zero, and uh, this is exactly the situation of a few slides ago. Okay, so uh, obviously, if you have this situation, you can have topology change in a kind of trivial way that I'm not really interested in, because an example of such a double is um, SL2C. So you have one factor is SU2, which is the three sphere, and then it's plus only T dual is uh, this monstrosity. And uh, this is topologically R3, unless I'm very mistaken. And so you have uh, S3 is dual to something which uh, is uh, the three-dimensional Euclidean space. And in general, um, oh, I missed an L here. In general, uh, you can, so everything that's a complexification of a compact, simple uh, Lie group is going to be an example. And you can construct the original and dual groups using uh, the Ivasava decomposition. Uh, but what I'm interested in instead is uh, change in the global fibration structures. For example, where you have a, a, a three-sphere bundle that goes into a non-trivial uh, this bundle. Um, and in fact, we have that. And actually, I misspoke. It's the other way around. So trivial this bundles go into non-trivial three-sphere ones. Uh, so that's the saner statement. Um, and the interesting fact is that uh, you can't just have ordinary principal bundles, you need these to be bi-bundles, and hopefully in my remaining time I'll at least motivate why this has to be the case. We tried very hard to avoid this because it's, uh, I mean, it was hard for us to work with, but uh, it seems totally inescapable. Okay, so uh, a lightning um, description of how this is going to work. So we go with a top-down perspective. So we start with the um, principal uh, left uh, bundle uh, with respect to a left action of the Drinful double group. And I'm going to call this a double struck M. So that's the one which has, um, that's the bigger space which I reduce in two ways to get the mutually dual geometries. And I put a connection on it. Um, and then for the h-flux, there's basically one thing you can write with just this data, which is uh, Chen Simon's term for this connection. And by the way, this is the globally defined connection one form of the total space, so this makes total sense. And then you have this uh, thing, which is a pullback of the base of the bundle. And uh, this is closed if the uh, first Pontragian class of uh, this bundle is zero. So we see from the from this factorization, this unique factorization, that if you take um, uh, big D modulo the left G tilde action, obviously you're going to get uh, the G subgroup and vice versa. So 
uh, the obvious guess is that the uh, original and TDL spacetime should be big M mod G tilde. This should be a G bundle, and big big M mod G should be a G tilde bundle in some sense. And this is also the case in the for abelian duality. Um, and okay, thank you. And this is what we actually realize. Uh, but you see, there's going to be a problem because basically there's no uh, ansatz for the, the, there's nothing you could plausibly write for this, this H flux 3 form. Uh, in the abelian case, you can take this and you can rearrange it so that you get a form with respect to the G tilde action here, which is horizontal and invariant. So this is A is the G connection, so it doesn't speak to the G tilde action, and F tilde is the G tilde field strength which is a torus, so it's going to be globally defined. So that's good. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a few more difficulties, but I think the essential point is that this factorization is non-commutative. So if you like take left G tilde cosets, they do not inherit the obvious left G action, even though uh, you can identify them with elements of uh, the G group. Okay. So, uh, we take a leap of faith and then we say, well, what if we assume there's another action that goes uh, the other way? And this is exactly what we did. Um, so, a bi-bundle, a principal one, is one where you have two principal bundle structures and um, one left and one right, and both actions commute and they have the same fibers. So, obviously, um, all bundles with a abelian structure group are bi-bundles, and uh, every group is a bi-bundle, trivially. You have left multiplication, you have right multiplication. And you can also understand this as an ordinary bundle equipped with a structure map that writes the left action as the right one, or the right one as the left one. And, uh, and this has some nice properties involving the group actions. Uh, it's equivariant, in fact. And it looks like um, a generalization of the adjoint action, maybe I should say conjugation action of the group on itself to a the case where you have a possibly non-trivial G bundle. And I mention this because um, if you hit a field strength for a possibly non-abelian uh, gauge connection here with uh, a structure map, this is going to look a lot like something that will be globally defined on the base of your bundle. And this is exactly what we need. So we have a nice ansatz for the H flux, and I'm going to hurry up. Um, so the, to be a bit more precise, we want this big space to be a G tilde bundle, and then we can write a, f a thing like this. So A is a G connection, so it doesn't talk to the G action. And then uh, F tilde is uh, a two form, locally defined two form on the base. But if you hit it with the structure map, then it's going to be globally defined, in fact. Uh, and this is the case when you have this very stringent condition where the, the structure group of the principal bundle goes to a subgroup of the center, which is, well, um, it's, it's very stringent, but we can and did find examples. And also, the nicest thing about this is that you can even when you have this for a principal bundle, not even a bi-bundle, it's automatically a bi-bundle. We explain this in the paper, it's very trivial. And uh, you can make everything work. In fact, you can even make everything work for this case that I already mentioned. So where you have, um, because the, uh, in the SL2C example, because the, Oh, oh, the the clock is screaming. Okay, so this has a non-trivial center. Uh, SU2 is Z2, plus one and minus one. The other one doesn't, so it's a nice example. You have trivial bundles dualized to trivial G tilde ones. And because I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip everything about how we did this and say there's a nice relation. We did this using um, QP manifolds, and this is how you, which are... Uh, graded uh, differential symplectic manifolds. And in principle, this allows us to do also the same dance, but for uh, U-duality and higher dimensional brains. So this would be a novelty. Ah. Uh, well, 
Well, I might as well uh I might as well end there. I was uh yeah. That was too quick to me. So, so in the definition of by bundle, you only had G, right? Uh, and then you needed both G and G twiddle. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, well, here G is an arbitrary group. So you sort of can reconstruct G tilde from from this data, or? Uh, well, it's unrelated. So here I gave it. I I forgot the fact that I was dealing with this pass only situation. So for any group. This is a by bundle, and if so, if you have this condition and this is a Drinfeld double, then you can, yeah. If you have a principal D bundle, then mm -hmm. you can get G by bundle and G tilde by bundle. Yeah, so this has th at least three by bundle structures when this is true. It has the, the one for the D group, it has the one for G, it has the one for G tilde, and they all talk to each other. Okay. okay. Other questions, remarks? Well, maybe I have one. I'm not sure I missed it. Uh, so in the very beginning, you said about T duality, and your kind of key intuition was that solutions go to solutions, basically. Yeah. Do you we still that. keep this, or is it weaker than that? The equivalence. Uh, no, solution go to solutions. So like the, the equivalence still is like a bijection. And the symmetries, what happens with the symmetries? What happens with the symmetries? Uh, well, that's, um, I think that's a, bit, that's a bit more complicated. So, uh, that's a good question. So in principle, you try to invert these, and then you have to check whether uh, the resulting expression actually gives you a good moment map for the original symmetry. But in fact, you expect it will be broken unless you are in very special situations. So the original thing has a circle symmetry and the dual thing, um, that's a bad example. So the original thing, uh, for example, has a three sphere and SU2 symmetry, then the dual thing uh, is going to have this symmetry, but not necessarily a three sphere one. Does this have some nice interpretation in terms of the current picture? In uh, terms of the current picture, yes, absolutely. So, um, in fact, we used a picture that's equivalent to the current picture. So, you can, uh, so we used a symplectic L2 algebra, it's or QP manifolds of degree two. These, these are automatically current. So, you can, um, in fact, the ones we used are exact current algebraids and You'll recall these are specified precisely by the data of, uh, well, a three form, a closed three form, or sorry, a representative of a, a third degree uh, cohomology class. So sorry, twisted exact. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, you have a nice, you can view this as a diagram of a current, exact current algebraids. So here we wrote this in a QP picture because we're more familiar with that, and that's the one that's going to generalize. Uh, but you can map this one to one to a well. I guess this is symplectic graded symplectic reduction. It's some kind of reduction of currents. Um, we didn't really bother doing the dictionary. Other remarks, questions? Okay, then let's thank Alex again. Thank you.